Doing very good. All right. Uh, kids are dismissed for junior church. And then if you'll take your Bibles and go to Philippians chapter 4, and while you're turning to Philippians chapter 4, let me remind you, I didn't say this earlier, but uh, baby bottles for uh, the Next Step Pregnancy Center down there in Pontiac. Uh, if you can fill these up with any spare change, or if you just want to write a, a, a check uh, for the center, you can write the check for Bible Baptist Church, and we'll just write one check uh, for the center. And again, this is uh, for the Next Step Pregnancy Center there in Pontiac. Uh, to help them as they reach out to uh, young ladies and young teenage girls uh, that are considering abortion, and they come to them because they offer free pregnancy tests. Uh, they now have the ability to offer free ultrasounds as well, so that uh, that young lady, that young mother can actually see that there is life in the womb. Uh, the little baby uh, that's there, if you've ever seen an ultrasound, uh, of a child in the womb. It is exciting. Uh, you can even see right off the bat, you can see uh, what their uh, character is going to be like, you know, how they're going to be. And uh, we've had children, we've seen uh, even sucking their thumbs in the womb, and they came out sucking their thumbs. Just, uh, it's an amazing thing. But this, this center obviously is there to help reach uh, mothers that are expecting who are confused. Uh, they've been told one thing, uh, that is not truth, uh, that life uh, does not start until after birth, but it starts at conception. And the Bible is very clear on that, and we obviously want to help them to see that, to see that life is precious, but also the center is there to even offer help after the baby is born with clothing and diapers and food, whatever they may need. So if you can take those baby bottles, and there's a few still left out there, Fill them up with your spare change, or again, if you want to write a write a check, or even put some dollar bills in there, and just if you would have those back by Father's Day if you're able to, and then we will turn all that over to the next <clears throat> excuse me next step uh, pregnancy center. So Philippians chapter four, uh, <clears throat> my voice is starting to go, uh, so hopefully it will hold out. Uh, but Philippians chapter four, I want to talk to us about the fact that Jesus is still the answer. Uh, we live in a world that's seeking answers, and we live in a country that believes one man sitting in an office has the answer, uh, because when they go through uh, their campaigns, they, they tout the fact that they have the answer to everything, but we don't. Uh, God has the answers for everything in life, and He has the answer for everything in your life. And we're going to look at some of this uh, this morning based in Philippians chapter 4. Um, I'll jump around and read about five different verses in this chapter, and then we'll pray and we'll talk about the fact that Jesus is still the answer uh, for everything in your life. Looking at verse number one, the Bible says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Herodias and beseech Sentichi that they be of the same mind in the Lord. I want you to skip down, if you would, verse number 4. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Look at verse number 7. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. Skip down to number 13 and verse 19. Verse 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. And verse number 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, again, we ask that you bless our time. Father, we ask that you would draw our hearts unto you this morning, that you would establish our thoughts. Lord, help us not to be distracted uh, by anything. Lord, help us to be completely focused on you this morning. Help us to hear your voice as you speak to us. Uh, Father, we don't take this, this moment lightly. Uh, Father, we know this is not just a church service. Uh, it is not religion. Lord, it is a, it is a time in, in a day, in a week, that your people gather together to worship together, to fellowship as born-again believers, as God's people, and to hear from heaven, to hear what you have for us collectively as a church and singly as an individual. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to understand this morning that Jesus is still the answer. Uh, there's no other answer to any other question in life. He is the fulfillment. 
And Father, we thank you that he sits at the right hand of the Father, having finished the work that you sent him to do here, uh, Lord, going to Calvary, laying down his life willingly. And Father, again, we thank you for all the men and women who have entered into the military willingly and have fought for the country willingly and have even laid down their own life for comrades at different times. Father, we ask that you would have your hand of blessing upon those families. And Father, I ask that you have your hand of blessing upon this congregation this morning. As always, Father, give the children uh, the ability to understand the Bible lessons being taught to them in junior church. Help them to have fun with the activities. And Father, I just ask that you draw their hearts unto Christ, allow the Word of God to take root deeply in their hearts to bring forth much fruit, the fruit of salvation, and then a fruitful relationship with the best friend that they can ever have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, we ask it all in His precious name. Amen. When you think about the verses I read, I want us to think about this morning the fact that Jesus is still the answer. And if we as God's people are going to make it in this life that we're living and do anything right in this life, it's going to be through the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be by the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's going to be in the Lord. I want you to go back and notice in these verses I read, in verse number 1, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Paul says to the church at Philippi, to the believers there, stand fast in the Lord. Then he goes on, in verse number 4, rejoice in the Lord. So he's telling them to rejoice, to stand fast in the Lord, and rejoice in the Lord. And you look at verse number 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through... Christ Jesus. He tells them that through Christ Jesus they can have the peace that passeth all understanding. You look at verse 13. He says, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's not a single thing that we cannot do for the Lord as he gives us the strength. We can do all things through the Lord Jesus Christ. And then verse number 19, he says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, on Wednesday night, uh, if you were here, then you, you heard the message, or if you watched online, uh, you heard the message that we talked about, the fact that our need is supplied based on Philippians 4 and verse 19. If you weren't here Wednesday or you didn't uh, see it online, I'd encourage you to go online and, and listen to that message, watch that message, because it talks about our need. What our need is, God has the supply for it. And I'll get into a little bit of that when we get to verse 19, uh, but I won't preach the whole message from Wednesday night, but I'll give you a few, more, a few points from Wednesday night to go with that verse. But when you look at verse number one, again, we live in a society, people are looking for answers, they're looking for people who have the answers, that say they have the answers, but as a child of God, we have to remind ourselves that Jesus is still the answer for everything in our life, whatever the need may be, emotionally, spiritually, physically, uh, our church needing things, your family needing things, you needing things, Jesus is still the answer. And as a child of God, we always have to look to him and go to him because, again, he's the one that's given us our life. He's the one that has redeemed us at Calvary. He's the one that has blushed, uh, washed us in his blood. He's cleansed us from our sin, and he's the one that gives us the strength and ability to keep living this life, even though this life becomes difficult at times. Uh, this walking through this life, we trip, we fall, people do us wrong. Uh, we get to a point where we just want to faint. We just want to throw our arms up in the air and give up. And the Lord Jesus Christ, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. He cheers you on. He gives you the strength. He gives you the encouragement. He gives you the peace and the joy to keep pressing on because he is the author and finisher of our faith. But again, as Paul writes to the church at Philippi, you remember there are, some, there are some people there at Philippi that we're familiar with, though we may not know their names, as the Philippian jailer who got saved when Paul and Silas were put into prison. Uh, the woman, Lydia, selling purple. Uh, she believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You had the young woman that, that was uh, being used for sorcery, and she was redeemed, and she was saved by the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, so he's writing to a church that has people in it whose lives have been changed, different backgrounds, different upbringings, but their lives have been impacted by the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And he writes to them that they would stand fast in the Lord, knowing that even though he's not there, they're still going to be faced with difficulties. They're still going to be faced with challenges. They're going to be faced with the temptation just to give up and go back to their old lifestyle. And he wants them to stand fast in the Lord, the very one that can give them what they need, whether it's hope, whether it's peace, whether it's strength, whatever it may be. Look at verse number four again. I'm sorry, verse number one of chapter four. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and longed for my joy and crown. So stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He wants them to persevere. And that's the first thing that Jesus is still the answer for perseverance, helping us to persevere and to continue on in this life and to stand fast in what we believe, to stand fast in our faith and our convictions, in our love for the one who loves us more than anything, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to keep your finger here in Philippians, but go back, if you would, to Galatians. We'll look at a couple of verses in regards to standing fast, <clears throat> knowing that Jesus is still the answer for, for perseverance. It's good to have friends that, that come alongside you and, and help you, and that's what, that's what Paul's doing. As Paul writes his letters back to these churches, and he even writes a letter to Timothy, he writes a letter to Titus, it's all to encourage them to keep living the faith, to keep trusting the one that they had put their faith and trust in for salvation. He reminds them that life is tough, the adversary is powerful, but Jesus Christ has all power. The devil may have a little power, but Christ has all power. He has the keys of death and hell. He bought the gift of salvation for us, and we have salvation, eternal life through the Lord Jesus Christ. But Paul does not tell the church at Philippi that he loves, because uh, you're in Galatians, but I want to read this again in Philippians. As Paul writes to these people, he says, Therefore, my brethren, he calls them brethren because they are brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, they're part of the family of God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, he says he loves them. He longs for them because he was joined to them when he was there. I mean, he, he gave a part of himself to these people, and he loves them for the time that he spent with them and for who they are. And longed for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. He encourages them to stand fast in their belief and their faith and relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't stand fast, Paul says, in me. Because Paul understands humans fail. Even good intentions can fail at times. Good, loving, meaningful people can fail at times. And he wants them to stand fast in the one who never fails, the one who never leads them astray, the one who never stops loving them, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in Galatians chapter 5, in verse number 1, as Paul writes to the church at Galatia, he, sa he says to these people, to these believers, to this church, stand fast therefore in the liberty or the freedom wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now Paul tries to encourage this church to stand fast, you know, in the freedom and the liberty that has been given to you by the Lord Jesus Christ, not to be entangled again with the yoke of bondage of this world. Again, as a child of God, I mean, hopefully you remember the day that you called upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved. Saved because you believed in what Jesus Christ did at Calvary. You believed in, the, in his resurrection, his, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And Paul says to this church in, in Galatians 5, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. There was a day in your life where you were in bondage to sin. You were in bondage to to the ways of this world. You could not get out. Your destiny, my destiny, was to hell, a place where God created for the devil and his angels. But unfortunately, all those that reject Jesus Christ, reject what he did at Calvary, will end up there if they do not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And as Paul writes to the church at Galatia, he reminds them of the freedom that was bought for them and the freedom that they have in Christ, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. He wants them to stand fast in that liberty, in that freedom. He doesn't want them or us 
to give ourselves back over to sin, to allow the devil to come back into our life and to control us when Jesus Christ has bought us and made us free. I want you to take your Bibles and go to Jude chapter 1. Jude chapter 1. Because you know what? There are going to be times in your life where you're tempted. You know, as I think about it, Peter. Peter was tempted to go back to his old lifestyle. In fact, he did go back to his old lifestyle because he thought he had messed up so bad that Christ certainly did not want him around anymore. Remember, Peter had denied the Lord three times, denied that he knew Jesus. He said, I don't know the man, don't know who you're talking about. And to prove it, he started cursing. I don't know what he was cursing. I don't know what he was saying. Maybe he was cursing the name of Christ. The Bible doesn't say, but the Bible just says he started cursing. And then he went out and wept sorely because as soon as he cursed, what Jesus said would happen, happened. The cock crew, the rooster crude, crowed, crude, the rooster crowed, and as soon as that happened, the eyes of Jesus fell upon Peter, and Peter looked at Jesus and went out and wept bitterly because he did what he said he wouldn't do. And then we find Peter going back to his occupation of fishing. Going back to his occupation of fishing, and not just fishing, but the Bible records fishing naked. Now, how much clothing was off to be naked? The Bible says he was naked. Because when he realized it was Jesus on the sea of Gal or on the shore of Galilee, because he called out and said, Children, have you caught any meat? And they replied, No, but they realized it was Jesus that the Bible says that he robed himself, Peter did, and, and threw himself in the water. And they all came to the shore, and, and Jesus addresses Peter right off the bat. I mean, he's, a, he's built a fire, there's bread, there's fish there for all the disciples, but he focuses on Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? He asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? He wanted Peter to forsake his occupation, forsake his past life, and do what he had done for three and a half years and follow Jesus. Yeah, he made a mistake. He did something he said he wouldn't do. But the Lord Jesus Christ came to him to restore the relationship. He wanted Peter to stand fast in what he had been taught, stand fast in his relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and stand fast in his faith. And the Lord Jesus Christ did that, came to Peter. Now, if you're there in Jude chapter 1, look at verse 24 and 25. The Bible says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Now unto him, that's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. I mean, just back up and, and just listen. Let the words sink in and think about it. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. Again, Jesus is still the answer for perseverance. He's still the answer to helping me finish the race that I've been put into. And we kind of talked about that in Sunday school, the race that we've been put into. The Bible uses that term, uses that word, the fact that we've been put into a race. We have a race to run. Each and every one of us as a child of God have a race to run. You've been set on a course of life and God wants to help you finish that race. And that's why we're to look unto the author and finisher of our faith, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're to have a a right focus, and we're to know that he's the one that's going to help me each and every day. He is the answer to helping me stand fast in what I've been taught, in what I believe, in what God says, my faith, the promises, the truths of God's word. We are to persevere. We're to stand fast in the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, therefore, my dearly beloved brethren, I longed for... Uh, back up. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord. Stand fast in the Lord. Let God be your strength. Let God be your focus. Let God be your help. As Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter uh, 2 and verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Standing fast in the Lord. Standing fast in His strength standing fast in His grace, because there are difficulties that will hit us 
on any, any given day. Uh, there are situations that we cannot handle, we cannot get the answer to, and we will feel like we'll be tempted to give up, to walk away uh, with, with, even, with even the attitude, the mindset, well, at least I'm saved on my way to heaven. But God wants so much more for you. God wants to give you so much more. God wants you to experience so much more in Jesus Christ. Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Again, I use him often for an example, but you think about Paul. Again, Paul was a man of God, used of God. He loved people. He loved the Lord. He didn't, he didn't mind having to travel by foot in his day to go from city to city just to tell people about Christ and to help people. But he had a thorn in the flesh. And some believe it was a poor eyesight because Paul had experienced on the road to Damascus blindness by the brightness of the glory of the Lord of Jesus Christ when, when he was saved on the road to Damascus as a murderer, as he was murdering Christians, and, and the Lord came to him and uh, blinded him with a light. And uh, three days later, the scales fell off, and he received his sight, but some believe he never regained full sight. And then later on, he's in a city. He's, he's dragged out. He's stoned and left for dead. And when they stone you, they're aiming for the head. And so they, they uh, you know, so... Uh, Bible scholars and, and Bible believers believe that this thorn in the flesh that he prayed for that would go away was, you know, his eyesight, that if he could see clearer, see better, he could do so much more. And yet the Lord did not take that thorn, as Paul calls it, as Paul describes it, didn't take the thorn away from him, but allow the thorn to remain. But what he, the answer he got from the Lord is, my grace is sufficient. My strength is made perfect in your weakness. And Paul is able to say, well, I'd rather glory in my infirmities. That's just not something that we normally would say or do. Oh, Lord, yes, I want to glory in all the difficulties of life, all the hardships, Lord. But Paul knew that, you know what, this was God's will. This was God's plan for his life. And he was willing, as he said, to glory in the infirmities. Not that he was, you know, glad for the infirmities, but he, he knew and trusted what Jesus said. My grace is sufficient. My strength made perfect in your weakness. And Paul said, well, I'd rather glory in my infirmities that the power of God may rest upon my life. His focus was the power of God in his life, the strength of the Lord. It helped him to persevere because he was standing fast in the Lord. And you and I need to remain standing fast in the Lord if we want to finish the race that we've been put into if we want to stay faithful to the Lord, if we want to stay true to our relationship, walking with the Lord each and every day. He already promised he'd never leave us nor forsake us. So it's not the Lord that has to, you know, keep being faithful. Though he is faithful, he wants us to stand fast in the Lord. And we can only do it in Jesus Christ's strength and grace. I want you to look back at Philippians 4 if you're not there. And if you are there, look at verse number 4. <clears throat> verse number four, Jesus is still the answer for perseverance, standing fast, but in verse number four, he's still the answer for praise. Look at verse four, rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Again, Paul is writing to people who do experience difficulties. We don't know, <clears throat> you look at scripture, we don't know what happened to the Philippian jailer after his conversion, after Paul and Silas left. No doubt Paul's writing this letter back to the church that was established and the Philippian jailer and his family being a part of the church. But we don't know the difficulties that came into their life after their conversion, after their life was given over to the Lord. Just difficulties just don't go away. But Paul wants them again to focus, rejoice in the Lord always, all the time, in every situation, and honestly, it's impossible without Jesus Christ to rejoice in everything. Because when you look at the situation you're in, you may not be able to find anything in it to rejoice over. I mean, you think about a just a financial, a financial difficulty where you don't have the money to make the financial difficulty go away. You don't have the means to fix it. And yet the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. 
even in situations that you have no control over, you cannot change, you cannot help, yet as a child of God, he still wants us to rejoice in the Lord and not let our situation rob us of our joy. Jesus is still the answer of joy. Again, our jobs are not the answers to our joy. Having the right job. You know, when I was, when I was younger, I thought, if, man, if I just had the right job. And, I, and in my mind, I had, I had the perfect scenario of a right job. A job where I didn't have to work hard. There were no problems. But I got paid a lot of money. So that was the right job. Well, you're not going to find a job like that. You're, you're going to have jobs that you may like your job, but there's still going to be difficulties there. And some people try to find joy in a job, joy in a relationship, joy in activities, joy in pills, joy in drugs, joy in an alcohol bottle. People are looking for true joy, and they're finding it in all the wrong places. It does not satisfy. Jesus is still the answer. Rejoice in the Lord all the way, and again I say rejoice. For the child of God, Jesus is still the answer for praise. I and you can still praise the Lord even in difficult situations, even when we don't have something that we want. Again, when you look at Paul, and we have to understand the Bible, when you read Genesis to Revelation, there's not a single man or woman in Scripture other than the Lord Jesus Christ who is a super Christian. When you read through your Bible and you read the accounts of men and women whose lives were touched by God and changed by God, and yet the difficulties they went through, you also see where they praise the Lord. I mean, you read Psalms, the book of Psalms written by King David, and he, he writes down a lot of his difficulties in his life, but in the same chapter, he also starts praising God for how good God is and what God's done for him. So even in the midst of difficulties, we can still praise, the, praise God for how good he is and what he's done for us. Because you know what? If you can't find anything good in your life, and sometimes people look at their life and say, well, there's nothing good in it. If you're a child of God, you have one thing that is the greatest, and that is your salvation. If you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, that's something to praise him for. Even though I may not have money to pay for this bill, this unexpected medical bill, yet I can praise God because I know that he'll supply my need. I know he'll take care of it. And besides that, I just want to praise him for how good he is and the fact that he has given me the gift of salvation. In Psalm chapter 5, verse 11, the Bible says, But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. And there's the key. If you put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have something to rejoice about. You can rejoice because you have the one who walks with you, who carries you a lot of times, the one who provides for you, the one who can change a situation and supply a need. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because thou defendest them let them also that love thy name be joyful in thee. Again, when you look at scripture, you see common men and women who choose to worship God and choose to praise his name in the midst of difficulties. I just, I love the life of Paul. I love his life because it's not mine. I would not want the life of Paul. You know, sometimes people wish, man, if I had so-and-so's life, I wouldn't have any difficulties. Everybody has difficulties. Paul had difficulties. Paul and Silas, again, he's writing to the church at Philippi. And do you remember what happened to Paul the first time he went to the city of Philippi? The first time he went there and he's helping people and he's talking to people and he's telling people that God loves them and Jesus died for them. It gets him thrown into prison. After the magistrates rip off their shirts and lash their backs 39 times and leave them bruised and bleeding and cut up. Then they're thrown into prison. But when you read in Paul's account of what happened, you read what the Bible says, at midnight Paul and Silas chose 
to pray and to sing. They put their focus on their Savior. They put their focus on Jesus. They don't know what they were praying. But there are some guesses because after the earthquake, they're praying, they're singing at midnight, they're praising God for who He is. God causes an earthquake and shakes the cell. All the prison doors open up, all the shackles fall off because there's nothing God cannot do. You know what, there's a, there's a door that God, there's not a door that God cannot open. There's not a door God cannot shut. I mean, there's nothing God cannot do for you. But the focus has to be praising Him even in the midst of difficulties. I mean, I don't know if you can get any more difficult than that. But being thrown in prison, your back bleeding, and they choosing to pray and to sing to God. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. It's something we can't really do of ourselves. It's the power of God in us. Psalm 32, 11 says, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, ye righteous, and shout for joy, all ye that are upright in heart. That's speaking of you, the child of God, the born-again believer, the Christian. Psalm 34, verse 1, I will bless the Lord at all times. The psalmist here, David says, again, he's making, he's making a conscious decision I will bless the Lord at all times. Jesus is still the answer for my praise. I may not can praise, uh, praise uh, the situation I'm in, but I can praise the one who's in the situation with me. Remember, God's always with you. The Lord Jesus Christ never leaves you nor forsakes you. Every storm that you go into is a God-ordained storm as a child of God. You look in Scripture, and Jesus, twice that we see, sent his disciples into our, across the Sea of Galilee. He sent, the, he, sent, he sent them in boats to go across the Sea of Galilee, and they found themselves in the midst of a storm later on, a storm that they could not get out. Experienced fishermen, they know how to work the, work the ships, they know what to do, but they could not get themselves out of these storms. But Jesus Christ was with them in both storms. One storm, he came walking on the water, the next, the, the other storm, he's with them in the boat. I mean, right there with them, and they're still scared to death. And they wake him up. So listen, choosing to praise is choosing to put our focus on the one, again, who loves us more than anything, the one who, who can change our circumstance, the one who can bring us through the storm. If the storm continues raging, we know that he can bring us through it. Again, he says in Psalm 34, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear, and be, uh, shall hear thereof and be glad. Psalm 146, verse 2, While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. Again, I want us to understand that Jesus is still the answer for perseverance in our life, for us to stand fast in what we believe. Again, when, when, uh, when he writes to the church at Galatia, and you were to look at, I believe it's the second chapter of Galatians, he kind of, Paul kind of rebukes the believers there and says, he kind of calls them foolish and calls them fools and says, are you so foolish that you have, you've left the faith? You have, you've turned from what's true to believe a lie? And then he helps them to get back on track. He wants them to understand that Jesus Christ is still the answer. Uh, you put your faith and trust in him to start with. Uh, don't, leave, don't leave off trusting him. Don't leave off following him. Don't leave off crying out to him. Allow him to be completely a part of your life, 100% leading you. Let your praise be of him. Go back, if you would, Galatians, or I'm sorry, Philippians, and look at verses 7 and 13. Verse 7 and 13. <clears throat> Again, he's still the answer. And, and this is not, this message and these points that I have and these different things I'm bringing out, obviously this does not encompass everything that Jesus is the answer to. But I can simply say Jesus is still the answer for everything in your life. Every problem you have, every illness that you have, everything. Paul had an illness. 
And yet the Lord gave him grace and strength to endure, to, to keep living for the Lord, to keep moving forward and not to allow his, uh, you know, his shortcomings or his health issues to keep him down. Paul was able to say at the end of his life as he wrote to Timothy, I've finished my course. I've kept the faith. Though it was trying, and Paul even testifies of how trying his life is. Every one of our lives is trying. I may not face the same trials that you face. You may not face the same trials that I face. We all have trials. But if you're a child of God, a born-again believer who's put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you and I both have the one person who is the answer to all of our problems. But I'm glad that we just don't have a life full of problems. We do have a life full of blessings from the Lord. But you look at verse 17, Jesus is still the answer for peace. The world is looking for peace. People are looking for peace. Again, there are, there are people in, in this world that will, that will say, I can give peace. And there will be no peace in this world until the Lord Jesus Christ sits on his throne during the millennium that Revelation talks about. Then there'll be peace for a time. And then there will be that last war, that last battle that's called Armageddon. Well, where our Savior finally destroys Satan and all his, all his workers. The greatest peace coming is eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ, eternity of peace, no problems. I'm looking forward to that, no problems, uh, no more death. And all the things that we face in our lifetime, no more of that, complete peace, complete perfection in heaven. But you know what? Even now, while we live through this life and in this world, this world that is anti-Christ, this world that is anti-Christian, this world that, that truly chews up and spits out people on a daily, even moment-by-moment -moment basis, you and I can still have peace because Jesus is the answer. Look, if you would, at verse 7. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So again, if, I mean, if we're going to make it in this life, it's going to be in the Lord, through the Lord, and by the Lord. And this verse says, through Christ Jesus. The peace that passeth all understanding. Again, there is a peace that will numb people. Again, the best that alcohol and drugs can do is numb for a short time. You know, people even try drowning out their sorrows and drowning out their problems even just being on social media, 24 hours a day. They find, there are those that find satisfaction, they, they find some comfort in social media because they can get on social media and lie about how good their life is when their life has fallen apart. Because I've seen it, I've read it, of people that I know, family members that I know, and I know the difficulties and the problems in their life, and yet on social media, they type how perfect their life is. It's like, you know, you're not even fooling yourself. But listen, Jesus Christ is the answer for peace. Whatever it is, I know there, there are many things that people will try to use to bring peace and happiness, but when it's done, vacations. I love going on vacation. But vacations can have their problems as well as our last vacation just a couple weeks ago had its problems as well, but we still had fun. But you know what? Vacation's over. Whatever fun and peace I had then, it's gone. But the peace that we have through Christ is eternal. It's a peace that's everlasting. It's a peace that, that fills you from the inside out. It's a peace that even in the midst of a storm, even in the midst of difficulties, even in the midst of of trials in your life that may never go away, you can still have this peace because Jesus Christ is your peace. David said in Psalm 29, verse 11, the Lord will give you, or the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. That strength is an inner strength. It's a strength that when you feel like fainting, spiritually fainting, you feel like you're at the end of your rope, it's the last straw in your life. 
Yet when you allow Christ to be your peace, he's the peace and strength that helps you to continue on, to help you to get back in the saddle, to help you to keep going forward and to have the strength that you need. He said in Isaiah 26, verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. That's not talking about keeping your head in the sand like an ostrich and just pretend like, you know, you know everything's fine, there's no problems, you know, what I don't see won't affect me. No, it's the one that you, your mind is stayed on, the one that you're trusting, the one that you're allowing to have control of your life will give you, will bless you with peace. That's what he says. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Well, I just don't believe that, Pastor. I don't believe what that, those words say. Well, let's look at what Jesus says. Take your Bible to John chapter 14 and verse 27 because Jesus is one that you can trust. There's a lot of people you cannot trust what they say, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the one who is truth, you can trust what he says, and this is what he says about his peace. John 14, verse 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, because the world's peace cannot do what the peace of Christ can do. The world's peace is only temporary, but the peace of Christ is eternal. He says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. Don't be afraid. But allow the peace of Christ to dwell richly in you. Allow yourself to truly trust the one who laid down his life for you. The one who does have the answer for everything in your life. No matter what comes into your life, no matter who does you wrong. No matter what, how many flat tires you, you end up with, how many engines you go through in your vehicle. I mean, there's just things in life that can take a toll on you, but the peace of Christ passeth all understanding. And we've got to rely on that peace, and we've got to make sure that, you know what, I'm going to allow Jesus to be the answer for everything in my life. Now, someone once said indirectly to me, a family member was... I don't need Jesus for a crutch. My friend, Jesus is not a crutch because crutches can break. Crutches can only hold up for so long. But Jesus is the rock that we lean upon. He's the one that holds us up. He's the one that keeps us from falling. He's the one that strengthens us. He's the one that keeps the storm from destroying us. So Jesus is still the answer for everything in your life, but for provision. What is it that you need? This is, the, this is the last point. I want you to look at verse 19, if you would. Because verse 19 of Philippians chapter 4 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches. And let me tell you, God never runs out. His riches never run out. Our bank accounts may run dry. Our 401ks may run out. I mean, all the things that we invest in financially, we're hoping that, they, that they're always there. But sometimes we're disappointed. But you think about, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Again, on Wednesday night, I preached a message that was entitled, Our Need your, our need, his supply. Whatever your need is, again, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional, monetary, I mean, again, whatever your need is, he can meet that need. He has the supply. But Jesus is the answer. Again, we're not to run our first, the first person we run to is to be God. He is to be the one that we, as, as his people, look to and cry out to first. But sometimes we, we as humans, we as people, we, we look to 
the financer. We look to the, to, the, to the bank accountant, the loan officer that, hey, you know what, can help me with this financial difficulty. When God's the one that wants to be the one that supplies our need. Whatever it may be. And, and I've got a few here that we talked about on Wednesday. All right. Your need may be strength. Lord, I need strength to get through this day. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, God says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. God says, I will be your strength. I'll be the one to strengthen you. I'll be the one to hold you up. I'll be the one to help thee, he says. But we may need rest. Again, we may be where life has taken a toll. Maybe a situation has taken such a toll on us, we just, we're at our wits' end, we're, we're stressed out, we're, we're physically sick. I mean, this, we have gotten to the point where our health is not good because we've allowed some situation in our life to take such a toll on us. And Jesus says in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come unto me, all ye that, are, that labor and are heavy laden. You're, just, you're trying your best, I and mean, you're just overloaded, and you're just, I mean, you're done with. And Jesus says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. I'll give you the rest that you need. I'll give you that spiritual rest, that physical rest. But he has to be the answer in our life. He's still the answer, but we have to look to him as the answer for our strength to continue on the rest that we need. Because life just does. Life can take a toll on you. There's not a single person where it doesn't, including me. Life takes a toll, and you need to rest in the Lord. And remember, you know what? He's the answer. Because though I go to sleep at night and try to get rest for my physical body, I need an inner rest. I need an inner strength that only comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. But he also provides guidance, guidance in your life. You might need guidance. Psalm 32, verse 8, David writes, I will, or David pins these words, and God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. God says, I will instruct thee and teach thee in the way which thou shalt go. I will guide thee with mine eye. Another place says that you'll hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. God's the one that will give you guidance in your life. Again, whatever you may need. And I think you know what you need in your life. You know what you're struggling with. You know what the difficulties are. And God wants you to be reminded through his word that Jesus is the answer. Because if you are born again, you have asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior. You've put your faith and trust in him then greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, but sometimes we neglect who's in us because we're looking out at the world at what the world has to offer. And what the world has to offer at best may and may not work. It may and may not last long. But Jesus Christ who's in you and with you, he's the answer. Because his answer lasts for eternity. Whatever it is you need, whether it's strength, whether it's rest, whether it's guidance, maybe it's eternal life. Maybe somebody needs eternal life. He's the only one that can provide eternal life. You know, just as people will choose what bank they bank at, what store that they shop at, there are people will choose who they will trust for their eternal life, for their eternal destiny. And Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, says, I'm the only way to heaven. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to have eternal peace. I'm the only way to have that eternal rest that you need. We're told in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be, be saved. Some are trusting in some other man that said that they were God and that they could give them everything that they wanted. Yet, there's none other name given among men whereby we must be saved, the name Jesus Christ. And then God tells us in Romans 5, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to have peace with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. God is not who some believe is just, you know, he's just a loving God who's going to allow everybody into heaven, no matter what they've said, done, or even if they believe in Jesus Christ. The only way into heaven is through Jesus Christ. Jesus is the answer for eternal life. Jesus said it. God tells us through his word in Romans 5, 2, by whom also we have access by faith, not by works, not by money, but by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Jesus is still the answer for eternal life. And someone may wonder, well, how can I have this eternal life? And again, we're told in Romans 10 that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Simple. Jesus says, I'm, I'm still the answer for salvation, and it's so simple, you just have to believe. You just have to put your faith and trust in what I did and not in what you're doing. He goes on to say, for with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I believe. Remember, Philip was told to go out into the desert, go to a place called Gaza by the Holy Spirit, and he, le he left Damascus, and he went out into the desert. And as soon as he got there, he saw, he saw a man in his chariot, an Ethiopian eunuch. He saw all those people with him, and the Holy Spirit said, go join yourself to that man. And the Bible records that Philip ran, and he got to that chariot, and he heard the man in the chariot reading from the book of Isaiah. And he asked, he asked the Ethiopian eunuch, he asked that man, do you understand what you're reading? He says, how can I understand unless someone shows me? Because you know what? A lost person cannot understand the word of God. It seems foolishness. It seems like that's so foolish just to trust in someone who died on the cross to get me into heaven. There must be something I have to do as a human because Humans, we're, we're used to working for things. We're used to working for a paycheck or working for a new car, or working for food. But you don't work for salvation. It's given by faith. The Lord Jesus Christ having done the work for us. And that's why we're told in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's simply calling on Christ, believing what he did, trusting and putting your faith in his death, burial, and resurrection, knowing that he paid the way for us into heaven. I want you to take your Bibles and go to 1 John chapter 5 because Jesus is still the answer for perseverance, for us standing fast in this life. He's still the answer for praise. We can still rejoice in our life regardless of what's going on. And he's still the answer for providing the strength, the rest, the guidance that we need, anything else you need, but he is still the only answer for salvation. And the Bible even guarantees this in 1 John 5, verse 11. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. God's given to us eternal life, and this life is in his son. It's in his son. It's not in anybody else. It's not through Mary. It's not through Paul or Peter. You know, Paul even had to address that in one of his letters because there was a place where the believers, they're saying, well, I was baptized by Apollos. I'm following Apollos. Well, I was baptized by Peter. I'm following Peter. Well, I was baptized by Paul. I'm following. I mean, there was a division in the church about, you know, who they were supposed to be following. And Paul writes a letter to say, hey, I'm nobody. Apollos and Peter, I mean, they're just, we're all servants of the Lord. You're supposed to be following Christ. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is your Savior. Christ is your Redeemer. He's the one that loved you so much that he laid down his life for you. And God testifies. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. In verse 12, he that hath the Son, Jesus Christ, hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. You understand, it's, it's not religion. It's not, it's not what someone else believes versus what I believe. It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the answer for everything in life. In fact, he's the one that gives life. He's the one that lights every man that comes into the world. No one's born 
without Jesus Christ giving that life. He's the giver of life. But he wants to give that spiritual life. He came and he died at Calvary. He bought us back. He paid for the sins. Remember, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. So he's paid. The blood of Christ has paid for our sin. But listen, we're blessed beyond that. We're blessed beyond salvation. And God wants to do so much more in our life. This morning, will you allow him? Will you allow him to be the answer for everything in your life? Whatever it is you may be struggling with, facing, let him be the answer. Let him give you the peace that you need that passeth all understanding. Let him give you the strength, the grace to continue on knowing that your God and your Savior will do right by you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And God promises to never leave you forsake. He promises to supply your every need, whatever it may be. But you know what? You and I have to be honest. Go ahead and stand if you would. We'll close the word of prayer. You and I have to be honest with our Savior and say, Lord, this is my dilemma. This is, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what, Lord, I don't even believe. Because remember, that father came to Jesus and said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Because life is just, it can take a toll. You can have strong faith, but you'll, if you allow this life to take a toll, it can wear upon your faith to where you get to a place where you don't even know if God will even hear your prayer. You don't even know if God will, is even looking at you. But that's where faith comes in. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I mean, even in Hebrews 11.6, the Bible tells us that those that come to God by faith, will they will receive, they will be rewarded, trusting in God, believing that he will take care of your need.